Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. Welcome back, everybody. Every time we have this guy on, he makes us think. Think about ethics, morals. Uh, sometimes it's connected to business. We've got something today. I believe it's a real-life situation that happened years ago, but what would you do in this situation that could potentially save your life and save others. He is somebody who's been an adjunct professor of business ethics, senior researcher and director, and business ethic principles have been in his life for quite a long time. Ronald Berenbaum is back on the program with us. Welcome back, Ronald. How are you? Hi, Steve. Good to be here. Great to have you here. This this case that we're gonna we're gonna look at and decide which way we would go goes way back right this is something from the i believe the the late 1800s that's right 1884 wow tell us where do we begin here okay well it involves a, a case in england uh called uh with the title regina and regina is the queen of course versus dudley and stevens and it's a uh, the storyline is that uh, four uh, mariners were, their ship was wrecked and they were cast adrift in a lifeboat. And after a while, they ran out of food. And before very long, they were starving. And uh, one of the, uh, this, this happens surprisingly often in those days. Uh, one of the accepted ways of doing this was to draw lots. But uh, Parker, rather, rather Parker was the guy who was sick. Uh, Dudley and Stevens uh, argued that since Parker was near death, or so they claimed, uh, that they should kill him right now. And Brooks uh, refused to participate in the discussion at first. And later on, Brooks said, well, why don't you ask him? And at that point, Parker could not be retrieved. So uh, Dudley, who was a captain, uh, killed Parker with a knife. And uh, he, uh, hmm. he, uh, they then proceeded to eat him, uh, though uh, Brooks had recused himself from the discussion it didn't stop him from ravenously eating more than either Parker or Dudley had done. Well, eventually they were quote unquote rescued and <clears throat> they were put on trial uh, for murder. Uh, it could have been mm. uh manslaughter uh, because uh, the defense to manslaughter would have been that this person uh, that you killed posed an imminent threat to your life, which Parker did not. But if they didn't kill him, there would be an imminent threat to their lives, possibly. So, because of, because uh, of, just for clarity, because of starvation? Because of starvation, yes. Okay. So, in any event, the case proceeded uh, there was widespread sympathy uh, for the seamen and uh, support for an acquittal. Uh, the defense, which had been successfully used in previous cases, was necessity. They had to kill him in order to survive. But, of course, the issue was... Was it because he was attacking them or was it because of things that Parker himself was instrumental in causing or could cause or not? That would be uh, the elements of the manslaughter defense. Uh, in any event, the Home Secretary, who was in charge of the whole thing, <laughs> was very much against that. He wanted them to be tried for murder. However, the uh, mm. the riff on that, the slight thing is that Harcourt was also very much opposed to capital punishment, 
which was the uh, the uh, punishment for uh, murder. So the case proceeded. They used the defense of necessity, which had been successful in England uh, up until uh, that time. But uh, in the United States, in a case some years earlier, uh, necessity had not been a successful defense. And uh, the uh, the the uh, mariners in question were convicted, but their sentence was commuted to six months by the President of the United States, John Tyler, and <clears throat> they were fined $20. So uh, as matters proceeded, uh, what happened was that the defense of necessity was not accepted for the first time that in England. Uh, maybe following U.S. precedent, maybe not, but in any event, it was. And they were sentenced. They were convicted of murder and sentenced to death. Uh, member Harcourt's against the death penalty. Mm. Uh, so he wanted to commute their sentence to uh, life in prison because he thought that it was still a very serious crime. However, the Solicitor General and other people in the uh, bureaucracy, or whatever you want to call it, argued that that, ver that, that uh, penalty could never hold up. Eventually, uh, all three of them were uh, released after six months in prison. So wow. that's the outcome, and the first time necessity uh, was not a defense in a situation like that, which was uh, fairly common in those days. This is a, a tough one to wrestle with because this person, well, let's go back over some of the facts. The, the individual uh, among the crew or among the group, if you will, uh, was in poor health, was about to expire it sounds like anyway. And then the others made that determination uh, because of that, they uh, sustained their lives using that person's life. Question, the person that was about to expire, did they pass on on their own or was their life taken uh, before that? Well, that was one thing Brooks had said. Why don't we consult him? In uh, mm. in previous cases, the people affected had uh, drawn lots even. But uh, in this case, he was not consulted. That was one of the uh, factual distinctions. They just decided the point at which time he had no chance of surviving, and they killed him. Mm. Uh, no, I think that's that's the hinge for me right there is they, you know, if that person said, OK, I I'm going anyway, I feel it coming on. I, I just see I can't even I can't even go on. You know, I can't even continue walking, whatever it might be. Um, You got to do it, then just do it. I'm OK with it. Or if they had an issue with it. Uh, you know, that's part, you know, one part of this. If they just naturally expired, then I, I think that changes the dynamics in terms of morals, ethics here. What are your thoughts overall? Well, in most of the previous cases, uh, they had either drawn lots and the person consented to drawing lots. And if he drew the short straw, he consented to being killed. Uh, in some cases, people even volunteered. In this case, the fellow was not consulted at all, so that was a distinguishing uh, fact. Uh, in any event, uh, these people did not have recourse uh, or did not choose to avail themselves of it, uh, of the various different uh, ethical uh, 
arguments or uh, considerations. Uh, the first of which you will recall from our earlier discussions was uh, utilitarianism, the greatest good for the greatest number. Well, you think first, obviously, in terms of three to one, well, that's it. The greatest number is three who will survive, but you can't be sure that all three will survive. Right. You can't even be sure that any of them will survive after killing him. And the, the second point is uh, mm. that um, the killing is, is wrong. Of course, there must there may be a limit to the extent to which one can uh, invoke uh, utilitarianism in which the greatest good is somewhat undercut by the great harm done to the minority. Now, uh, a further argument was, well, when you talk about the greatest number, you have to talk about the fact that uh, these uh, these other sailors all had dependents. They had children, they had family, everything else. Parker was a 17 year old orphan with no children. This is the one, so, this is the one that was ill. Yeah. So okay. they, that argument was discussed among them. And so that added uh, to the uh, greatest number consideration. My, my overall feeling here is that if the person didn't consent, then I'm leaning toward it would be murder. Now, I, I understand you know, it's the survival of the fittest. Uh, you know, I got that. Um, but if that person naturally passed on or consented, it changes everything. Uh, just because the person was ill, who knows? You know, what if he might what, have survived? They might have died, but they they made a decision, and none of them were professionally qualified to do so. Yes, that he was on the verge of death, and that they had given him a fair shot, and that was it. But what if, what if now we got to play, you know, the, the the other side of the coin here. What if a boat pulled up, rescued all of them, had medicine, medical treatment for the 17 year old? I mean, very, you know, very hypothetical. But what if or what if he turned around and he was feeling better? Um, they made the decision to take his life because he was not doing well. Uh to sustain their lives. You know, my feeling is, I guess, waited out a little bit longer. I don't know. You know, we're, obviously we weren't there, but you know, what are, what are your feelings on all of that? Well, uh, I going to present all the different approach, uh, okay. other approaches, but I will say sure. my feelings are that, uh, comparable decisions are, often made by business people. You remember the Ford Pinto case sure, and the rupturing fuel tank, 20 of them. Well, 20 out of all the number uh, of uh, Ford Pintos that were sold. Uh, but then you remember that to make a, uh, an adjustment in the construction and the design of that uh, fuel tank uh, would have prevented uh, those ruptures or reduced the number and it would have been minimal. And Lee Iacocca said, no, uh, safety doesn't pay. Uh, and he was taking a very uh, rigorous mm -hmm. and perhaps uh, not particularly uh, good uh, application of, well, if, if we have to charge $15 more for this uh, car, we will sell X number fewer and we won't make as much money. Safety doesn't pay, he said. So these kinds of considerations are not unknown, even in our day and age. And uh, often they are made by business people. But another approach would have been uh, Kantian uh, categorical imperative, which is what uh, would you, what, what, kind of decision would be uh could be translated into 
a universal law that could be used in all situations. Hmm. Uh, and the, the problem is that Kant himself realized and, and said that you have to begin with uh, what is the, uh, what is the uh, decision that will result in the uh, least harm. People are the ends, not the means of uh, a decision-making outcome. And the other interpretation of Kant is, well, you save the most number of people. Well, uh, that's uh, then you get back to the same sort of considerations we had with utilitarianism. Then there's another guy, John Rawls, more recently, uh, a theory of justice. He said, emerging from a veil of ignorance in which you know nothing as a case to first impression, what decision you would make. But Rawls is also quick to add, would you make your decision on the basis of which outcome would affect the largest number of people beneficially or which outcome uh, or uh, and would you make that even if some people would be seriously disadvantaged? by that decision, if they'd be seriously disadvantaged, would that disqualify that outcome? Uh, then there's the last approach, which I kind of like, which is uh, not much remembered these days for good reason. It's Aristotle's classic virtue uh, theory, which means you have to cultivate habits of virtue all your life and that your efforts should be put into uh, into doing something, uh, taking an action when you have a choice that will result in your self-improvement and that society and its institutions should support and encourage you uh, in making those kinds of decisions and educate you in ways that you can. So, you know, that's... Uh, and Aristotle was much more widely read in in England in 1884. <laughs> he is anywhere today, uh, but certainly there were some people who believed that and thought that that should have been the rule. Well, wow. there's, you know, there are a lot of variables here. Um, for me, it's clear based on everything that, and, but let's, let's, let's look at this in another light as well. Should they be tried for murder? And what should the penalty be in this situation? It's not like somebody walked up to somebody on the street and fired a shot. It's a different situation, the preservation of life. So I would assume the penalty should not be as severe. And I'm, I'm not even factoring in what the outcome was. I'm just taking it as here's the situation. What would be the, uh, the remedy for the situation or the penalty for the situation? Um, but I still feel morally ethically that there was no consent on the part of the 17 year old uh and he was still alive when they took his life so i i have a challenge with that i know that they wanted to you know sustain their lives uh but what about this guy <laughs> so well, think about issue. it for a minute each one of them has a potential manslaughter defense because in killing parker who was a sick guy uh, they were acting to save the lives of the other two. Forget about me. But, but of course, I'm also acting in my own defense because if I don't eat him, I, I too will die. But they have a manslaughter defense. But the defense of necessity, that it was necessary to kill him, which had been a defense in the past, was eliminated, It was overruled. And eventually it became manslaughter uh, in line with uh, the earlier U.S. court precedent. Hmm. So let's 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 recap what the ultimate outcome in this was. What I know we had a couple of different uh, scenarios or cases that you uh, cited. 
Well, uh, I'm not sure I, un I understand the question. I mean, the fact is that uh, necessity had been accepted, that it was necessary to kill him. It was okay. necessary. And I don't know what the grounds for necessity were. They seem uh, the most obvious are that if they didn't kill him, the three of them would die. Uh, but it might have been necessary to kill him because he was in such pain that, you know, it, it would be worse for him to die a natural death. And so the defense of necessity uh, has uh, been uh, rejected. Mm. And as far as I know, never reasserted in any similar case uh, since. And <clears throat> nonetheless, they did something wrong. They were convicted of manslaughter. They did spend uh, six months in prison, as did the U.S. Uh, defendant. And uh, they weren't fined $20, <laughs> as the U.S. defendant was in 1841, which in constant dollars is probably about $12 million today. But <laughs> yeah, well. Um, in any event. <laughs> so I, I wonder, I wonder here, this is a case from the late 1800s. What if tomorrow we learn of the same situation, an unknown island, very small one in the South Pacific, same situation comes to light in 2023. How do you think it would be handled? I think, first of all, I don't think they'd be put on trial for murder. I don't think murder would be the charge. Uh, in probably, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 jurisdictions in the United States, maybe more, uh, there is no capital punishment. So that would not be the penalty for the crime. Uh, they might or might not be put on trial for manslaughter. Hmm. If so, I think the outcome would be quite similar. Interesting. Hmm. Um. I can't see it going in a different direction than it already did. You know, I, I have my feelings that, you know, that the, the necessity claim, um, and I, I, you know, I, I, I guess it goes back to what the penalty was. It wasn't a long jail term. There was some, uh, financial penalty involved in all of this. Um, well, since know, they'd been held in custody, awaiting the trial, uh, arguably, and I don't know exactly how it turned out, but uh, the six months, they could be immediately released if they had been held in custody for more than six months. But still, you know, the taking of a life in whatever circumstance, six months is a relatively short period of time, even, even under the manslaughter uh, uh, charge. Yes. Yes. You can get a lot more for manslaughter. Sure. Sure. Um, so I guess it's fairly reasonable that it was reduced to manslaughter. Um, it's a tough one because you know, it's, you know, it's that, you know, it, but, but you know what, it goes back to even the Ford Pinto case. Like you said, it involves the loss of life and the, what, it, what appears to be uh, the disregard for that by the car manufacturer uh you know you could look at it that way how many lives were lost because of that gas tank some or the issue never would have arisen got time for a really quick one to think about literally you, one minute left i'm not even you kidding. you are standing at the controls uh in a railroad station as far as which train goes over which track okay, okay a train is barreling into that railroad station on one track is a woman and a baby asleep on the track. Okay. On the other track are 15 people. Uh, you have to direct the train on one track or the other. Which one do you do? Wow. <laughs> oh, here, here's one that it's easy to understand and people can, uh, can use this one uh, with others. Uh, and you have to make a decision. You have to. Tough decision, but if I had to make a decision and I can't put the brakes on, it's it's going down one or the other track. Is that right? Mm-hmm. All right. 
Mm. Yes. So just so we're clear, lives will be life will be lost in some regard. There's no way of getting around it. No way of getting around it. I probably would gravitate toward the away from the the 15 because it's more people and the the, the mother and child. I, if, suppose, if that's, they're, suppose they're all convicts being transferred from one jail to another. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going there. Yeah. <laughs> uh yeah, I that's a tough one. I'm 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 tapping out. I'm tapping out at this point. Uh, yeah. but yeah, interesting. And uh you know what? Why don't we table that for next time? Process that everybody. I'm gonna process that. Um, but an interesting twist that you threw in there, because there's lots of questions and we don't have time for those. Uh, but wow, good stuff today, Ronald. Interesting. Uh, what's your email address if somebody wants to, to comment on any of this? Love to share it. Uh, it's ronald.berenbeim, B E R E N B E I M, at gmail.com. Excellent. And if you have a comment uh, and want us to uh, share it next time on any of this, instant feedback, Steve at gmail.com, you can always reach us. And uh, we'd lo I'd love everybody's uh, input on that next time we get together. Ronald, uh, lots to think about. Thank you so much for today. You're welcome. Good to see you again. You too. We'll be right back. Are you looking for even more of the podcasts and hosts that you love? The Podcast Business News Network is proud to announce that you now have even more ways to listen live. Check out the MyTuner Radio, Online Radio Box, and Simple Radio apps on iOS and Android, or find us online. Search for Business News Network on mytuner-radio.com or search Podcast Business News Network on streama.com and onlineradiobox.com slash US. Take your podcast on the go and don't miss a minute of the action. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. For nearly 2,000 severely injured veterans, everyday life has become filled with barriers. Day-to-day -day simple tasks can become pretty daunting. I have to carry my chair up two flights of steps or have somebody do it for me. What scares me the most is just the falling. When I'm struggling with my house, I think, you know, to have that one great barrier just knocked down, I mean, it's, it's crucial. Home for Our Troops is a wonderful nonprofit that builds a mortgage free, fully adaptive, handicap accessible house, and there's no catch. It'll be our very first home that we've ever owned. This is a game changer. This is where your life begins again. We need you to join us in completing this important mission. Please visit hfotusa.org and help build homes and rebuild lives. Because of you, everything's going to be okay.